Yeah, hello. My name is Michal Kubiček. I'm working in SUSE Labs as kernel networking engineer. And today I would like to talk a bit about some ways in which we are trying to make the Linux networking stack able to cope with uh, network uh, speeds, which are growing all the time and usually faster than the CPU speeds. So, So let's take a look at a typical TCP packet because TCP still uh, makes uh, the majority of uh, networking traffic these days. Uh, we have some data block uh, from application layer prepended by uh, headers from TCP protocol, IP protocol, and usually for packets going through Ethernet, there, are some, there is an Ethernet header and uh, checksum at the end. So this is what we are processing, uh, what we are passing through the networking stack. Uh, in the receive path, we are passing the uh, packet up the networking stack to higher layers, and we are peeling off the headers from the packet. On, in transmit path, when we are sending a packet, uh, we are passing it down the stack, and we are adding headers from inside out. For forwarded packets, we go through part of the usual RX uh, receive path and then part of the transmit path. Uh, we, uh, we, for forwarded packets, we don't go through higher levels like TCP module or other higher level protocols. So in transmit path, uh, things are mostly simple because we are um, Almost all the transmit path is performed in context of the sending process. So we go through the transport protocol, which is TCP or UDP most of the time, uh, network protocol, IPv4, IPv6 mostly. This is also where the routing takes place. Then we have link layer depending on the device, the driver of the outgoing device, and finally the device when it actually sends the packet to the line, to the uh, then it uh, tells us that the packet has been actually sent and we can forget about it. Uh, receive path is a bit more complicated because uh, there are three different contexts. First, it's uh, the driver, which uh, the lower part of the driver, which uh, works in hardware interrupt context. Uh, it's called from IRQ handler. This prepares the data structures for the rest of the networking stack and uh, fills them with the data that uh, are received from the device. Second part, the uh, most important part from kernel point of view at least, is uh, done in soft IRQ context. This is where most of the processing takes place. Uh, the internet uh, IPv4, IPv6 protocol routing, other things like uh, net filter, transport protocol implementation, uh, all the TCP protocol or UDP protocol. And uh, this ends with uh, passing the data from the socket, extracting data to the socket queue. Then the third part takes place in the context of the receiving process, uh, which calls uh, one of the many syscalls, like uh, read, receive, uh, receive message and so on. And from kernel point of view, it just uh, identifies how much of the socket cube it has to fill into the user space buffer and uses copy to user to pass the data on to user space. So uh, let's, take look, uh, let's take a look at what exactly is the problem we are facing. This table shows uh, calculated number, theoretical numbers for standard packet size, MTU of 1500 as usual, three gigahertz CPU, which is kind of standard these days. And in the columns, we have uh, Ethernet speeds, 
common Ethernet speeds, uh, starting with 100 megabit Ethernet, which once in the past was called fast Ethernet, and ending with uh, 400 gigabit Ethernet, which is currently what the fastest experimental devices can support these days. Uh, I had a similar talk uh, two and a half years ago in spring 2017, three and a half years ago, and then uh, this table ended at 100 gigabits. So it, you can have at least some idea how fast the speeds are growing. So the first uh, line shows uh, what, what would be the number of packets per second for these speeds starting with decent 8,000 and then at 32 million per second. Uh, second line, it's the number we, uh, is the time we have for processing one packet. 120 microseconds is quite a lot. 30 nanoseconds, uh, not so much. And last line is this time per packet we would have if we did actually process each packet separately. Uh, translated into CPU cycles for this standard, say, 3 gigahertz CPU, which means uh, 400 uh, megabit Ethernet, it was 370,000 uh, cycles, which is quite a lot. For 400 gigabit, it would be 92 cycles. If you have some idea how the CPU works, you can imagine what can one achieve in 92 CPU cycles. So the problem is that the demands, uh, customer demands or user demands and the speeds of the hardware are growing quite fast while CPU uh, speeds and CPU uh, abilities are not growing nearly at that fast. Uh, what makes the situation even more compli uh, complicated is that we have to deal with uh, rather complex device configurations where we don't have a simple network card that would be uh, would correspond to a simple networking interface uh, but have uh, combinations of cards uh, combined in bond uh, then we have vlans on the on top of that bond some bridges uh, often we uh, even have to pass the packets into uh, VMs, virtual machines, or containers, which means uh, more device. And each of these devices means some uh, another piece of code which processes uh, the packet and passes it on. And this is a relatively simple configuration in, for virtualization hosts or virtualization hosts or uh, cloud hosts, uh, we can have even um, more complicated setups. And also, when virtualization, uh, uh, when we, have, we are virtualizing, we also have another networking stack after this in the guest. Another, yeah, another piece of complexity is that we have more complex protocol stack because we don't have uh, only those simple packets as I've shown in the beginning. We also, we also have uh, tunneling protocols like GRE or today um, more popular VXLAN, which is often used for, um, uh, for cloud hosts and uh, similar setups. Uh, so we have uh, multiple layers of protocols, which also complicates the processing because uh, once we get, uh, once we uh, process the tunneling protocol, we, we need to go back down to IP and process the inner packet again. So let's take a look at the CCP packet again. That's the picture we had in the start. And uh, there is something wrong in this uh, with this picture, which short hint would be this popular picture. 
the problem is that uh, the scaling doesn't actually work. Uh, the headers are um, quite oversized because in real life, the typical data packet would be much longer and the headers are rather small. So if I wanted, uh, if I took a standard 1500 bytes long TCP packet, uh, the actual proportions would rather look like here in the lower picture, uh, which is good because uh, for most of the kernel networking stack, we don't actually care about the red part, about the application data. All we are interested in are the headers. So it's actually good news that the headers are very small because that means we don't have process that much of data. So it's rather tens of bytes, not more. So let's take a look at the data structure used by uh, data structures used by kernel uh, when dealing with uh, packets. The ba uh, basic structure is the socket buffer, or usually called SKB. Uh, the simple loop would uh, would be like here. So we have some allocated by buffer. Uh, there is some data in it, not necessarily starting at the start of the buffer. Uh, the initial part is called the head. The, the uh, trailing part is called the tail. And we have four pointers to it, where the mo uh, most important pointer is data, which points to uh, what we are actually dealing with at the moment. While the packet passes from down up in the receive part or from up down in the transmit path, the position where the data pointer actually uh, points uh, changes. So when we are peeling the headers uh, in the receive path, the data pointer moves from the left to the right. So while we are uh, in working with IP protocol, the data pointer points to the beginning of the IP header. When it's passed to TCP protocol uh, code, uh, the data pointer points to TCP headers, to the start of TCP header. And in the end, when we are uh, enqueuing it into, into the socket queue, uh, the data pointer po points to the start of the application data. Uh, in a similar fashion, the tail pointer, which identifies the end of the interesting data, can also move to the left or to the right, but that's, uh, that is not so frequent. The head and end pointers, uh, on the contrary, are fixed because they point to beginning at the end of the allocated buffer. So what does the memory representation of a packet look or what did it look in the old times? So in the old times, we had one structure, SKBOOF, which contained packet metadata. This was allocated in a, this is allocated in a dedicated slab cache. The size is slightly under 256 bytes and uh, which is not much, but it's also not small because there is a lot of information in it. And it's actually a problem because if you want to add anything to struct escape of, uh, you would rather need a very good reason to because there is not much space left. And if we get over the 256 bytes, that would mean another cache line and a lot of performance fallout. So that's something that's almost impossible. Uh, there are pointers to the socket buffer where the actual packet data reside and uh, also parsed information from the headers from already processed headers uh, because the, we don't want to look into the packet data again and extract the information again and again if you need it multiple times. And then there is a linear buffer or was a linear buffer with the packet contents which was allocated in generic slab cache because the size depends on the buffer size and uh, on the 
uh, bucket size, of course. Uh, this was not perfect because there were some problems. Uh, this kind of representation, this kind of memory uh, layout was very would be very inefficient for big buckets. Uh, like those which we are uh, we work when using offloading uh, segmentation uh, segmentation offloading or things like LRO or GRO where multiple received packets are uh, combined into a big one uh, because allocating a big slab object of all up to for 64 kilobytes would be very inefficient. And also, there is another problem because the device uh, wouldn't be, uh, couldn't put the data directly into the allocated, pre-allocated slab, slab object, or at least not easily. And um, so we would have to copy the data from the device into the slab object, and that would be a rather slow operation these days. Of course, this simple traditional uh, version was only used in the times when the networks were not nearly as fast as today. So at some point, uh, I don't remember exactly when, uh, this changed so that uh, the initial socket buffer only uh, holds the uh, initial part of the packet and uh, Today, this initial part actually mostly uh, consists only of the headers, uh, usually for typical Ethernet cards, that would be IP header and uh, TCP header. The rest of the packet uh, is put into page fragments. Each page fragment occupies a part of a page. Uh, this part does not necessarily begin at the beginning. Uh, even if most of the time that is the case, but uh, it's useful to be able to have page fragmented, which does not begin at the beginning of the page. For example, it allows us in specific situations to use one page for multiple fragments, and uh, which is all, for example, used uh, often used for so-called header fragments, which I'll explain in a moment. And also, uh, as I talked about the tunneling protocols, for tunneling protocols, we, don't, uh, we need to uh, move some, uh, the inner headers into the initial linear part so that then the first page fragment would start not at the beginning as it used to. So uh, the the socket buffer, the linear socket buffer, was uh, extended by so-called shared info, which is uh, the name shared info comes from the fact that if we have cloned packets, so-called cloned packet, then this shared info is actually shared by all clones. And the uh, most important part of the shared info is the array of um, structures describing the uh, uh, the page fragments. So the socket, uh, the linear buffer only uh, has the initial part of the packet and the rest of the data, most of the data is uh, laid in the page fragments. Uh, one of the problems is that the linear part is still in a slab object so that we need to copy the data from the device. And uh, another problem is that the implementation for some technical reasons limits the size of the array of uh, these frags or page fragments to 17, well, 17 in the usual case of x86-64 architecture, uh, which is fine. The, the idea was that uh, 70 pages are enough to cover 64 kilobytes, which is maximum size of a packet. The problem is that uh, this only works if we can fill the whole pages with the page fragments, but that's not always the case. Because for example, when a packet is combined from multiple incoming 
equity handed by buckets uh, by GRO or LRO. Then we have smaller page fragments and uh, 17 fragments of um, something like 1450, 1450 bytes is um, I think something like 26, 28 kilobytes. So these limitations were addressed by another uh, improvements. So now the initial linear part can be also a page fragment and actually for most common and of course the uh, most performant network cards, it is a page fragment. And that is exactly the case where multiple page fragments can occupy and uh, can share space in a sing single page. And uh, in addition to the uh, page fragment frag array, uh, we can also use the fragment list, uh, which was originally uh, designed for use with IP fragment reassembly. But um, since recently, I think three or four years ago, uh, we can actually use this list in, com uh, in combination with the frag array to be able to have a uh, Packets with more than 17 page fragments and filling up to 64 kilobytes with GRO. So that's uh, one example of uh, the of uh, more complicated packet processing and more complicated data structures used to be able to. Uh, squeeze as much performance as possible out of the networking stack. Uh, next topic. Uh, next, we, uh, in addition to uh, changing the data structures used for holding packet data, we also change the way the packets are processed. So um, the oldest uh, was that uh, while the original design expected an IRQ coming for every incoming packet, for example, in a C uh, to the device, uh, this was very inefficient. And so the NAPI uh, was this, uh, invented. Well, the N in NAPR means new, but um, well, it's it's no longer new, actually, it came with two six kernels, so something like 2003. Actually, it was designed uh, around 2000 because it was in 2.5 uh, kernel series and was eventually uh, backported even to 2.4, 2.4.20 or something like that. So it's uh, not very new anymore, but uh, uh, the idea is that rather than uh, having an ARQ, an interrupt for each incoming packet, uh, we actually, the driver actually allows the soft IRQ to pull for more packets so that we ask if there are more packets and process as many as we can. Or there are some limitations uh, because that would hurt latencies a lot if we processed all available packets. So there is some limit uh, which changed multiple times. It's how many and how for how long we do process incoming packets. And if there is still some work to do, we leave it for the uh, sort of IRQ daemon. Uh, another similar feature is busy polling, which is done on the socket le uh, level, where the application can indicate that it uh, prefers uh, extremely low latency so that it's pulling for more packets even if there are none in the incoming queue. Uh, of course, that comes at the expense of higher CPU load, so it's used only for a specific application. This was introduced in 3.11 kernel. Uh, another important part of packet processing is checksum offloading. The importance of uh, check sum of loading uh, comes from the fact that both uh, calculating the checksum for purpose of filling the header uh, header field and for checking an incoming packet, checking the correctness of the checksum uh, 
uh, would demand, if done completely in software, would demand going through the whole packet. Well, uh, here I'm talking about the transport layer checksum, which means TCP or UDP, uh, because IP header checksum is calculated only over a small block of data. But the TCP or UDP checksum would require processing the whole packet contents, or most of it. Uh, that's why I wanted to point out the picture with the actual size proportions. Uh, fortunately, all reasonable network cards worth considering support uh, checksum offloading for TCP or UDP over IPv4, and most current network cards also over IPv6. What can be a problem and what poses a problem is that if we have uh, more complex protocol stacks uh, like UDP-based uh, tunneling protocols, GRE, VXLAN, Geneve, and others. And what is the even bigger problem is that uh, when we have multiple nested tunnel tunnels, because uh, then we get into a problem, into problems because the way the checksum offloading is mostly designed for most of networking cards uh, means that uh, the network card actually only tells us on receive that the checksum is correct, but uh, it does not tell us the value of the checksum uh, or over what block of data it was actually computed. Uh, this means that the card uh, most cards will actually only check the checksum of the outer IP header, oh, sorry, outer UDP header, but not of the inner headers. Some of them will be able to check both transport layer checksum, outer and inner, but if you have multiple nested protocols, they don't go all the way inside. And uh, so, the best way, at least from the kernel networking uh, developer point of view, would be if the uh, if the network cards actually didn't try to be too smart and uh, provided us a way to do a generic checksum of a specific block of data so that we could then uh, calculate the inner checksum from the outer ones. Uh, similar, we have a similar situation on transmit. Uh, the problem is that the, these generic offload, this generic offload is only supported by very few cards, and most vendors prefer, uh, prefer the specific checksum for specific protocols or combinations of protocols which leads to something called uh, protocol ossification because it, uh, it's, a, an, uh, it's a big entry barrier for introduction of new protocols. And also it limits the ability to use uh, complex uh, complication of uh, combinations of nested tunneling protocols and so on. The problem is that uh, from marketing point of view, it's nice when uh, each new generation of the network adapter uh, can be uh, said to have new features. Uh, when you support the generic offloading, well, that's once and once for the whole, for, will always be generic. If you can add a new combination of protocols, new protocols with a new generation of network cards, then it's a new feature which can be uh, pointed out in marketing materials. So that's kind of conflict of technical and marketing uh, criteria. Another important uh, feature used to uh, process packets faster is segmentation and coalescing. Segmentation uh, is important for transmit part, coalescing for receive part. The idea is that um, when we are processing packets, then most of the packet processing, with very few exceptions, uh, does not re the CPU demand of uh, processing does not really depend too much of, on packet size. 
because we are mostly looking only into the short headers at the beginning. So when we are processing uh, packets of 100 bytes or 60 kilobytes, it doesn't really make much change, much difference. So the idea is that uh, for throughout most of the networking stack, we try to where have uh, packets as big as possible. So in transmit path, we generate packets of up to 64 kilobytes. And we go with those big packets through the whole networking stack and split them just before passing to the device. Or if the device allows it, if the device supports it, uh, we can let the device split them itself. Uh, this is what the TSO, TCP segmentation of load, means. Uh, recently, we are also doing this. Um, this is a matter of last two years or so. Uh, we can do this segmentation of loading uh, or this segmentation use all, even for UDP. Uh, this was mostly motivated by the introduction of the Quick protocol by Google uh, because they want to squeeze as much performance as possible from the stack as well. In receive path, we are doing the opposite. We receive short, well, relatively short packets, and we combine them together. Uh, the original implementation called LRO was done by the hardware, by the device. Uh, the problem is that it didn't work. It had its problems, and the biggest problem was that it did not allow, did not work with forwarding, any kind of forwarding. That means both bridging and routing. Uh, which led to a lot of mysterious uh, issues. Uh, later, GRO was introduced, which is done in software, is more careful, does not uh, combine packets, which are uh, not really uh, the same, or, well, it's, it's very complicated, and I don't, don't want to go into details. Uh, the result is that GRO works well with forwarding. And uh, recently, some uh, there are some network cards which actually support GRO, but implemented in hardware, which is the best, of course. So the GRO, uh, when done in software, takes place just after the driver and before entering the rest of the networking stack so that almost all networking stack is uh, passed with the big packets. Uh, and so we don't have to go with as, as, so, so many packets through the stack. Well, uh, one of the problems is that the CPUs are not getting faster in the sense of uh, instructions per cycle. Well, there are, but not fast enough or frequency, but we have more uh, CPU cores. So we could uh, get some more performance from parallelization. The problem with parallelization is that uh, we need to distribute the load, distribute the packet traffic somehow to the CPUs, to multiple CPUs. But we don't, to, don't want to do that randomly. We need to keep packets belonging together for example, from one TCP connection together on the same CPU. Otherwise, the performance would uh, take a big hit. So we have RSS, Receive Site Scaling, which is a feature supported by network uh, adapters, uh, where the device provides multiple queues and distributes the packets, the received packets over these queues. Uh, there are multiple criteria we can define which uh, header fields should be used to uh, calculating the hash used to distribute the packets. And uh, there is also some support for tunneling protocols, which is important. Uh, for example, if we have two hosts with one tunnel and many flows going through the same tunnel, then we don't want all of them to end up on the same CPU. And uh, most of these uh, 
high level or enterprise network adapters also allow setting explicit rules where we can pick a specific uh, combination of ports, for example, and addresses of ports and send them to a specific use. All this device, uh, of course, depends on the device capabilities. Another problem is that the number of the device queues is usually limited and often smaller than the number of CPUs we have available. Uh, okay. Uh, therefore, another feature, the software uh, implementation called receive packet steering was uh, introduced, which does the distribution in software, which can be uh, it can be used in addition to RSS or to replace RSS on devices which don't support it, and it allows distributing to as many queues as we can use. Usually, the number of queues would be the number of CPUs available, logical CPUs. It's based on a hash, which again is mostly computed by the device, if possible, because we don't want to do that manually or in software. And we, we don't have the limit of how many queues the device supports. Uh, of course, it uh, takes some CPU cycles. So. But uh, for hosts where we don't have a limited number of flows, but we have many flows, many different flows to different other hosts and different ports. Uh, this RPS, uh, this uh, uh, this RPS can improve the uh, improve the performance a lot. There are of course some issues with the parallelization, as in many other uh, areas of kernel in networking. Uh, developers quickly found that uh, techniques and algorithms which were scaled well to say four or eight CPUs do not scale as well to 64 CPUs or 100 CPUs. So, for example, global spinoffs are essentially unusable in a fast path. Even and even atomic counters, for example, for F counting, may be too expensive in some locations. So there is, uh, you can see a general move to RCU, per CPU data structures, and in general, local algorithms. So for example, stats are, uh, stats moved to per CPU counters. For high load cell, uh, servers, uh, that was a big rewrite of the CPU center to work in a localized fashion almost no classification, which improved the informants for high load uh, TCP servers a lot. Uh, the IPv4 routing lookup was reworked in 3.6 um, to scale much better for many CPUs. Uh, the IPv6 routing lookup is not as good as IPv4, but uh, since 4.2 kernel, it uh, scales again much better thanks to caching only the exceptions not uh, all routing lookup results uh, and so on there are many other improvements uh, done in this session usually in response to congestions detected in parts of the networking stack Uh, uh, another thing I would want to talk, uh, would like to talk about, um, of course, if we can offload as much work as possible to the device itself, it's always better. So that's why we have the switch dev framework, which is a uniface, a unified interface for management of the device, which do some kind of packet switching. Uh, this is mostly used for smart switches. Uh, which is which can uh, so maybe uh, many of you were in uh, Thomas uh, Bergendorfer's uh, talk in last labs conference where he was showing actually one of those switching and what can be done with uh, uh, with it in recent Linux uh, kernels. Uh, 
Uh, there is also support for some firewall, firewall and router, devi router devices, uh, but uh, the offloading of routing and firewall is still in development. And also some multi-port network cards are using this framework, mostly the cards which have an internal switch so that you can <clears throat> you can uh, switch packets between uh, switch packets between uh, multiple ports. Uh, and also some some network cards which have uh, many as in hundreds of virtual functions because there are some limitation of the SRIOV implementation, the original SRIOV implementation, which would be hard to overcome. So many of modern uh, network cards supporting many VFs, like hundreds of virtual functions, uh, are actually using this interface. And there is also a new configuration tool and API for this, which is called DevLink. Uh, virtual functions are another uh, tool to improve the performance because, as I was uh, saying in the beginning, on virtualization host, we have the problem that uh, we have actually two networking stacks, stacks to pass, one in the host, one in the guest. Virtual function is uh, works as a separate uh, PCI device, which can be uh, provided to the guest so that uh, we don't have the guest can access the network directly and not via the host, uh, if we want that, of course. So while in, in the old uh, implementation, the, such switch device usually had some proprietary SDK or command line interface and proprietary applications, uh, to configure the device, to manage the, manage the device, to monitor the device, with switch dev, with switch dev, we now can handle these devices in essentially the same way as uh, any simple Ethernet card. So use the same tools like IP, uh, IP root utils, ETH tool, and uh, DevLink, and so on, and uh, still have most of the packets processed the data path processed uh, in the hardware without uh, without uh, the uh, meaning a load for our device while we still have the full power of linux configuration and and the last uh, last topic i would uh, like to talk about or say a few words about in the remaining 3 minutes uh is Express Data Path, known as XDP. Uh, sometimes when you look at the program of the networking conferences in past, say, three years, you might think that there is nothing else than XDP going on. This is not completely true, but uh, it can some, sometimes feel the way. Uh, it's a response to growing popularity of, of tools or frameworks like DPDK, which completely bypasses the networking stack and does all the networking in the user space. Uh, there are multiple problems because uh, it's kind of completely incompatible with the rest. So you have to completely take the device out of the uh, management of the networking stack and uh, uh, dedicate some resources to it. And you have absolutely no control on what it is doing. So we need uh, something that would allow simplified high performance packet processing. So the design of XDP is that uh, we, uh, we have a two framework for simple packet processing in the very low, at the very low level, at the, just at the driver, even before we allocate the SKB structures I talked about in the beginning. So we can save a lot of a uh, lot of effort for packets which do not actually need it. A typical use of XDP would be uh, DDoS protection, where we, where we can uh, drop specific packets very quickly and very uh, with a very high performance. Uh, 
it uses eBPF program, extended BPF program, which is associated with the device. There are some limitations. The packet must fit into one page for to simplify the processing or simplify the interface. The XDP program processes the packet and returns some result. What to do with the packet? Drop it, forward, or pass it up to the networking stack. And finally, there is AFXDP, which is which allows to pass the packet directly to user space via a specific interface, a map mostly, which is a direct replacement for for DPDK and things like that. These eBPF programs are jitted for better performance. Michal, um, yep. Um, we have a request from the chat, Andreas Farber. Um, uh, just a minute, I have like two or three sentences, then we can move to the questions. Yeah? And uh, one big advantage and one uh, the biggest reason probably for popularity of XDP is that the XDP program can be reply, replaced, can be changed, modified without recompiling the kernel. That's the reason why we are currently, uh, there are currently implementations of XD, of many interesting features done completely or mostly in XDP with some kernel helpers. Uh, so from simple like packet drop for DDoS protections to more complex like TCP sync room keys, there was a talk about that in this year's uh, Bumpers conference. There are some even attempts for connection tracking, uh, container or VM packet distribution, and so on. And there are some attempts to remove the XDP limitations to, uh, for example, the limitation of one XDP program per device, so that there could be more than one uh, programs. Currently, this is kind of worked around by combining multiple programs together into one big program. The limitation of four kilobytes per packet or limited eBPF capabilities, but the problem is that it is kind of at the expense of the uh, simplicity and effic uh, efficiency. So we will see where the goal goes. So sorry, I'm a bit over like two minutes. So okay. now we can move to the questions. There was one question in the chat from Andreas Ferber. Yeah, NK comment on where user space techs are still claiming to save time. Oh. Well, I'm not uh, deeply familiar with, say, DPDK and things like that. But uh, of course, there is some uh, there is some uh, some space for savings. For example. The networking stack uh, does a lot of things with the packets and has a lot of features. So if you uh, if you want to do very simple processing and very limited processing, and you don't need most of its features, its features re-implementing only limited stack in user space can be useful, of course. But uh, if I remember correctly, the benchmarks uh, there were some. There was another talk in this year's uh, in this year's uh, Linux Pumbles conference where there were some numbers from real life comparing DPDK with, with XDP, and it showed that uh, with some help and with some careful configuration and uh, setup, uh, one can get very close to DPDK with AFXDP and in some tests even uh, get better results than DPDK. Okay, so I think we have to stop this session to allow for the next one to start soon. Thank you very much, Michael. Okay. Thank you for the attention.